Okay, you say, oh, that guy already talked, why is he up here again? Well, I'm not going to talk again, other than just to introduce the, 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 the panel. What we have here are four living GI resistors from back in the day. There was four other GI resistors who were sat circulating around in the crowd here who yesterday appeared on a similar panel at University of Puget Sound down in Tacoma where a similar exhibit to the one that's here, a smaller exhibit, uh, but curated by Ron Carver, the same guy that created this exhibit, is on display for the month of October down in Tacoma. So we are trying to do a regional approach here, and so those guys spoke yesterday down there. These guys are going to speak for your uh, edification today. Now, uh, as a warning, I want to say that this crowd of people, all of whom knew each other back then, um, hasn't gotten together for 50 years. Wow. And that <laughs> creates a little bit of a problem. There was a pandemic. Well, there was a pandemic, but that only counts for a couple of those 50 years. Um, so uh, that creates one subtle problem, though, which is that if you take four people to witness a car wreck, you're going to get four different versions of the story. So uh, it's very likely that there will be conflicting memories about stuff that happened 50 years ago. But I want you to take that as a sign of authenticity, just like range marks on fine leather. That, um, that uh, uh, the fact that, um, that we actually have people gathered together who are going to tell stories about what they themselves did. These are heroes who, for their own reasons and in their own ways, uh, resisted the, the U.S. aggression in Vietnam. And so without any further remarks on my part, what I'm going to do is uh, um, introduce, uh, closest to me is Dave Henry. He was in the U.S. Air Force, stationed at what in those days was called uh, McCord Air Force Base, now part of Joint Base Lewis McCord. Next to him is Jim Klemanski, um, and, uh, and the other two guys that I'm about to introduce, all three of them were in the Army. Um, then we've got Terry Irwin, who is uh, that uh, guy that's talking about beer already. And, um, and then we got... Um, oh. <laughs> Michael Royce. <laughs> Mike Royce, <laughs> my dear friend, who have only known for 50 years. <laughs> I have um, the same problem. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think Jim has said he wanted to go first. So Jim, you got ten minutes, and what we're hoping is that people will will tell a little bit about what they did, what motivated them to do what they did, and what lessons they may have learned. After that, we'll have we'll open it up for questions and answers, and we hope to have a vigorous discussion uh, 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 after each person gets sort of their uninterrupted time to tell their story. Jim, go ahead. Here's your uh, here's your microphone, brother. Do I need a microphone? Yeah. Well, yeah, speak into yeah, it for the... My two dangers? <laughs> okay, I'm... As opposed to the other members of the panel, I'm an officer. I was, I was an officer. Actually, I still have my... We can stand up if you want to stand, stand up. Stand up, hmm? stand up there. Pick, pick the microphone I can stand off. over there, I guess. No, just pick, pick the microphone off and just hold it in your hand. There you go. I always complain when I, besides being... I produce a television show, and I always complain that the people who... I'm directing and producing with, don't know how to hold a microphone. But guess what? Since I never go in front of the camera, I never know how to handle a microphone. <laughs> but I'll try. Uh, you're supposed to do it correctly. And I don't know, can you hear me? Yep. I'm just, okay, I'm doing it right. I tell them to do this, but I'm always sitting down over there. Well, I wanted to be an Army officer since as far back as I can remember. I mean, two years old, three years old, something like that. What was interesting, or strange, was when I was in probably the third or fourth grade, I decided I'm going to pick three countries to look at and study. I was going to be a history person. And one of them was Vietnam. I didn't know where it was or anything like that. But I said, Turkey, Vietnam, Chile, that sounds good. They're scattered around the world. And I learned about Vietnam and kept learning about Vietnam and I'm still going to be in the military. But we decided to go to war against them. <coughs> While I was in college in ROTC, I said, well, what am I going to do here? I'm going to be an officer, 
I'm probably going to be an infantry officer. I've studied special warfare. What are they going to do with me, and what am I going to do with them? It was, it was a question. And I, I spoke out against the war in college, back in the mid-60s, and I said, this war is going to keep on going. Something's wrong. And I'd, as I'd known about Vietnam, about the history of it, the colonialism of the French, how the French were, had their ass kicked by these people, I mean, really terrible. They, the, they, Viet, you talk to the Vietnamese people when you go to Vietnam, and they remember Dien Bien Phu and the French, and they still hate the French. How many years since that? 1954? They still hate them. When you go to Vietnam, where are the French? There's a French embassy, but I didn't find it, and I didn't see any signs in French. But I saw signs in English. First off, very interesting about Vietnam is it uses the Latin alphabet. It's the only country in Southeast Asia that uses the alphabet. Latin alphabet. And so it's easy to read it. If you can learn, and not too difficult to learn Vietnamese for that reason. And when we came, I came over there with a group, there were a number of GIs, former GIs, who were in the tourist group I was in, and they were all worried we're landing in Hanoi. And they had actually been to Vietnam. I had not been to Vietnam for other reasons, um, thanks to the military. And they were worried how the people were going to react to them. And if we came out of the customs office, I pointed to them across the whole airport, said, see that sign over there? You want to know who won the war? There's that sign. Popeyes, Louisiana cuisine, in the biggest letters you can imagine. Right there, landing in, in Hanoi. And when I talked to the people in Vietnam, I would ask them, well, what did they think of America? We killed a million people. I, I, and that's not an exaggeration. We lost 55,000 Americans and 100,000 wounded and maimed. But we killed a million of them. And I asked the guy who was our tourist person, I said, what's it with America? What, what's happening here? I go down the street and there's Prada, Tiffany's, all of these shops that I'd find in New York City. There's Starbucks, and there's the mat coffee mug, that coffee mug, it says Hanoi, Starbucks Hanoi. I'm thinking, what's happened here? What did we win and how did we do it? Or did we win? And the, that's a big question. When you're in war, is a big question is what's winning and what's losing? And so I was like surprised and I asked, he says, why don't you dislike us? You don't like the French, why don't you dislike us too? He says, we won, he said, we won. And you gave us what we needed. And you gave us the protection, and you let us have an embassy in the United States. And you know how Americans come over here now? You see it, there's Starbucks, there's Popeyes, there's all of these places. You've come to us and guess what? You bring the money. We're happy to have you here. We're not fighting with you. We've settled our differences. And we don't like war. And what's interesting about that is when I walked around Hanoi, I looked at the museums, the Fine Art Museum, the History Museum, fantastic museums, all done by people from New York and others, the creative artists that they brought in to I mean, the fabulous museums. And then I went to the War Museum, a piece of junk. You know how you see the pictures on television now about the Russian tanks piled up <clears throat> and everything else? That's what you see at the War Museum in, the French, in Vietnam, in Hanoi. It's just junk. They had all this stuff. There's one guy at the front door. And I said, is there anybody else here? He says, no. Does any of these exhibits work? No. Why? What do we care about the war? We won the war. The war is over. We don't hold a grudge. We want you here. We want to come there. And that's it. It was very interesting. So when 
I was in the army, fight, and the army was being was fighting the war. I was wondering, well, how is this going to be perceived by the the enemy, the Vietnamese, and by Americans? And what are we doing? And why should I? What what side should I be on? Because I realized that the American side was wrong. We were just taking over from the French. And right after the, near the time of we were taking over from the French, Curtis LeMay, a good general that he was World War II, said, let's nuke them. Let's kill them all. Luckily, President Eisenhower, who was a general, said, not a good idea, and just pushed them off to the side. But then you had Lyndon Johnson and Nixon, and they continued the war because they didn't know how to stop it. And as an American, I had to decide, what can I do to stop this? I'm an officer and I'm going to be an infantry officer. What am I supposed to do? Go over there and shoot people? I can't do that. How do I avoid doing that and still be an officer in the military? And what can I do as an officer in the military to stop others from doing the same thing? And, you know, there are people who say, I'm going to refuse to go to Vietnam, go to jail, and whatever. And I thought, well, that's a possibility. But maybe I need to do more than that. I need to go and try to convince other soldiers and sailors and airmen to not support the war. And what I found as I got into the Army and go to infantry school and special warfare school was that I wasn't alone. That here it was in the late 60s, and I would say such a significant portion of the American military hated the war. And they hated it not just because of war, but they actually knew that we were on the wrong side. It was amazing. When I was in special warfare school, I'm, I was, they knew that I was against the war. <laughs> they were trying to get rid of me. <laughs> and up comes a half a dozen special forces sergeant majors. I mean, the highest enlisted rank, big bruisers, 240 pounds, walking down the hall at me, towards me at my desk. At, and I was the only officer in the center that afternoon, because everybody else took off. And these guys come up to me and asked who I was, said, we were looking for you. And I said, what for? We wanted you to know we were against the war. One said, I was in Vietnam six times, I'll never go again. And, and the, other, the other five shook their heads and said, we're not going either. And these were the best. These are the ones who, would, who knew how to fight, knew how to deal with war in that kind of situation. And they said, they're not going. And they're telling that to me. I said, why are you telling that to me? We want to tell somebody, and you're the one who's going to tell everybody. Oh, oh. And they also knew I was working on Bragg briefs, which was where the Special Warfare School is, Fort Bragg. And it was really interesting that they searched me out and found me and told me this. And this is what, they weren't the only ones. Officers came up to me and privately told me, I'm with you. Of course, they were not going to do what I was going to do. They weren't going to work on the newspaper. They weren't going to speak out. But they wanted to know, tell somebody, and that's what they did. And they said that if they're told to go to Vietnam, they're all going to retire. I don't know if they did or not. But it was obvious, and I think even to the command, that the army was no longer trustworthy. The war was over. And this was in 1969, 1970, and the war was over. If you talk to any veterans at that, that time who were over in Vietnam, they said, yep, we marched off 100 yards, sat down, waited all day, came back and said, hey, we killed a bunch of them, and that was it. And they didn't do anything. But it was written down that they had won another battle. And the generals, a lot of them were just unaware. They actually thought that they were going to still win this war. And everybody else in the army knew they weren't. 
And that was really interesting. I, I worked on a paper in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, called Bragg Briefs. And I even put my name on the masthead. And of course, that didn't go over well <laughs> to letter generals. But I was amazed that I met no opposition. Ten minutes. It was, and, and we got more and more people <clears throat> publicly stating that they were against the war, too. And of course, they said, we're going to send you somewhere else. <laughs> and that's OK, you know, as long as I didn't go to Vietnam. <laughs> and off I came closer to Vietnam, because I came to Fort Lewis. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do with me. And I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. And I helped create the Lewis McCord Free Press, which we said, I, I made sure it came out on payday every day, every month. It, they didn't have to pay anything, but if they did, and we would collect hundreds and hundreds of dollars from GIs at every mall in the area. You would always recognize them. Somehow, they always looked like GIs. <laughs> Not difficult. And they, they wouldn't pay 25 cents. They'd give me $10. And we were able to mail the paper to all the basic trainees because all of the clerks in basic training were on our side. And they'd give us the roster, and we would mail them in. And one time, a captain said, oh, I can't let them have this paper. And he put them in this desk. He didn't know that his clerk was one of us. <laughs> and we called up the postal authorities and said, this guy is stealing the mail. <laughs> and one day, two postal inspectors knocked on his door and said, um, you're not giving out the mail. And he said, what do you mean? I, said, so, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, you don't? Lower right hand desk drawer, open it up and show us what you got. All the newspapers. They all have stamps on them. They have an address on them. He says, here's your choice, Captain. You can, I can arrest you, and you go to jail, or you will go and hand deliver those newspapers to all the people whose names are on those papers. And he thought a while, and he handed out the newspapers. <laughs> so that's what we were doing. We made sure that the military knew that the military didn't like the war. And that was important. That's what we were doing in act, on active duty. It was here on this base, on that base, on that ship. And it had an effect. Because as I discovered, I hardly met anybody except senior officers who hated my guts. Everybody else was against the war. And they would make sure that I learned about that. And I, would, minutes. Get, and I would get telephone calls about what was happening. We heard about you today. <laughs> oh, OK. But we covered it for you. And it was amazing how quick this snowballed. So that in the year and a half that I was on active duty, it changed from one to another. I mean, the, the number of people who would come out publicly against the war was increasing exponentially. And so the newspaper, which we produced 10,000 copies of every month, was actually distributed. We went to the malls, we mailed them, we handed them out, and people read them. And why they, one of the reasons why they read them was because it was about them. It wasn't just politics. It was, this is what happened on the base last month. This is what the generals said. This is what happened here. This is what happened there. And so they said, oh, our, our, hey, our command got mentioned today in the paper this, this month. And that had even a greater effect. Everyone on the base knew it, from the lowest private to the general who commanded the base. And that was what we were doing to undermine the effort at the war. And I think we had an influence. We, they decided that I wouldn't go to Vietnam. 
because they didn't know what I would do. Because they asked me. They said, would you go to Vietnam? I said, I've never disobeyed an order. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. At least not to get, you know, have a choice. And they decided that when I said, they asked me what I would do, they said, you tell me, what would you do if I was there? And they thought, and they said, they realized that they'd probably have to have 20 people watching me 24 hours a day because they wouldn't know what I was going to do. And so they decided, that's pulling off too many troops for one guy. <laughs> and so we wound up having an organization of the GI Airmen Coalition, and it had probably about 50 members who were active in putting out the newspaper, demonstrating in front of the base. We would drive off the base, um, get out our, you know, change our clothes in, in the vans, come out with picket signs, and, and march across the front, of the front of the main gate. And they couldn't stop us, because we were not on the base, we were on the bridge. And they didn't know what to do. They wanted, at one point, they wanted to decide that I was in uniform because I was wearing my army boots. <laughs> I said, you sure they're army boots? <laughs> I paid for them myself. You don't know where I bought them. <laughs> they look like army boots. And they decided that wasn't a good one. Eventually, they tried to court-martial me, but they couldn't come up with charges. And they had to give me something to do. And they gave me, put me in charge of all the prisoners in the stockade. I was there to see that they were properly treated. And they hated that. But not the prisoners. <laughs> so those, they, the commanding officer said it was the last thing he was going to do was get me out of the army. The day I was discharged was the day he retired. <laughs> and I went up to him and said, we're out the same day, Colonel. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. But that's how it was. But, okay. One or two more things. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was a year and a half out there, and I, was, and I did my job, which caused them to pro have a problem. I was in charge of the supply for the brigade, and everything was missing. <laughs> And I put it together, and I, I had my team find everything that was lost. And I told my commanding officer, I said, here's the choice. I'm not signing for that. You've signed for it. If you give me trouble, you're the one who has to pay for all the missing stuff. And I said, but I will get everything for you, and you leave me alone. And he did. And when every, back in those days, they had an annual inspection. These generals and colonels would come over and see if the base, everything's running properly. <coughs> and one of the things that I did was someone had not gotten their money, their, their pay. Three months, they had not been paid, and he's crying. And I said, I'll take care of it, general, and I did. And I happened to know the chief of finance and a good drug dealer, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but he got him his pay, and he went back to the general and said, I got my pay, I got my pay. So when the... The, the IG inspection made its report. They described everything, said that the, the supply room was in great shape, better than, you know, considering what it was last year. And then he said, the general said, he, I was the example of what they wanted in the army. Uh, the colonel almost fell over, but everybody in the back laughed. But he was right, because what we were doing was considering what the army was supposed to do. And we weren't supposed to kill people in Vietnam. They didn't, they were not harming us. We should know what war is. We're in the military. We shouldn't be killing anybody. That, we weren't defending ourselves. And when you look at the wars that we fought in the last 20 years, who are we defending? So, that's what we were doing when we were in the Army on active duty. And I'll give you an idea. Okay. I relinquish my time to the gentleman from Maryland. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, uh, we'll have a counter uh, version of the story now. Terry, why don't you go next? Okay. But uh, don't take his example and go for that long. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not, I'm, my name is Terry Irvin. I'm from central Illinois. Um, I hail from the twin cities of Bloomington, Normal, Illinois. And I grew up in Bloomington, which means I grew up as close to normal as you possibly can. <laughs> um, I, was, I was drafted, and I, a little background on how I got opposed to Vietnam was before I went in the Army, of course. And, um, it was personal for me. My, my brother went. I had a lot of friends that went to Vietnam, and every one of them came back scarred, either physically or mentally. One, one of my best friends came had been in a mind blast, and his back just looked like the surface of the moon. Um, another friend of mine who, um, was a tunnel rat in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and he came back and he just bragged about these horrible atrocities that he'd committed. And it, it was perfectly fine with him to cut a man's testicles off and shove them in his mouth. And, I didn't want any part of that, and I organized. I helped organize stuff on this little campus in um, Lincoln, Illinois. We had Vietnam moratorium days, and, and uh, we we had the student newspaper, which ended up being a mouthpiece against the war. And we <laughs> the college wouldn't print it, so we had to mimeograph the thing and pass it out to students. Um, well, anyway, I, I get drafted, and. Uh, I go up to Chicago to the induction place, and then I passed. I turned left and coughed and made it, and uh, I, I, I didn't want to go. I just, you know, I, I went back to Union Station, the train station. I was prepared to get on the train and go back to Bloomington and wait for them to come and get me and take me off to jail, and I didn't want to go to Canada, so. And I'm sitting there in the Union Station thinking to myself, you know, you can do that, you can go to jail for a year or two, or you can just go back to the induction center and let them cut your hair and, and uh, they'll realize their mistake after two weeks and they'll send you home. Well, it took them 18 months. <laughs> but uh, eventually they realized their mistake. Um, I was in basic. And my mother sent me a, a little flyer from the Pacific Counseling Service. And they were, this was a service that counseled GIs on how to become conscientious objectors and stuff like that. And I thought, hell, if I can get out from being a conscientious objector, I'll do that. So I called them up, and, uh, and these guys said, well, where are you stationed? What, what uh, unit are you in? Uh, you got Sunday off, we'll be over to pick you up. Uh, you know, I'm in basic training. You, know, you, can't, you can't go leave your <laughs> unit in basic training. So Jim Klamaski and uh, Dale, what's Dale's last name? Borgeson. 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 Okay. They picked me up. I hop in, in Jim's VW microbus, and off we go to Tacoma. But first, we stop at the liquor store. <laughs> it's my 21st birthday. Aww. So, yeah, we had we had a, a nice party. I there were girls at this place. <laughs> I hadn't seen a girl in a month and a half, and uh, I just it was I felt at home for the first time since I'd left home, and I knew I wanted to be a part of this organization. And graduated from basic. Well, I can't think of any great stories about basic, but got out. Of, got out of basic and uh, went home for Christmas. Came back and was waiting orders to go to Vietnam. And the orders didn't ever come in. They sent me to a supply position on base. So I went from Lewis to Lewis, and I had a reputation already because I, I kind of did everything I could to, to screw up so that I wouldn't go in in the first place. So I had this 
this rap sheet of the shit that I'd said when I went in. And, uh, but they treated me well and allowed me some distance to <clears throat> spout off now and then. And, uh, but I kept in contact with PCS and, and eventually but they invited me to come and live at the Big Red House. And the Big Red House is where a bunch of us live together and, and we put out um, Lewis and Cord Free Press. And I helped write, I helped distribute, I helped, I did everything that I could to get the paper out. Plus we had this counseling service down in Court C in Tacoma and we, GIs had come in and, and we talked to them about conscientious object, objectorship and, and uh, just give them a place to feel at home more than, than on base. And we did other things. We were involved in community things. Uh, we did a, a spaghetti dinner every Every Sunday. Every Sunday, okay. <laughs> and then I got to meet all these other resistance groups. And there was, um, well, there was an, an anti-war group of, civ of civilians that we hung out with a lot. And Jim had taken me over to meet the Black Panthers now and then. That was, we don't have any Black Panthers in normal Illinois. <laughs> and, and anyway, there was a whole network of, of resistance folks that we all supported each other. And the longer I stayed with these folks, I guess the bigger my reputation got within the service. Because I, I had difficulties going anywhere without getting arrested. <laughs> I, I, uh, one of the early things, I, I don't remember what I got arrested for, but uh, there was a warrant officer who was with the CID, the Criminal Intelligence Division, is that what that stood for? Something like that, yeah. And his name was Mr. Dudley. Mr. Dudley was a, a uh, part of my military career, because every time I got in trouble, he'd show up. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was... I was stationed at the uh, the processing center, so my job was to, to <coughs> meet guys that were coming back from Vietnam and other overseas, and I'd hand them out luggage or hand them out uh, bedding and take their luggage and store up while they were processing out. And uh, so I worked days, eight-hour shifts or twelve-hour shifts, eight to eight, and uh, one day I. Uh, took about 30 papers with me and went down to the processing place where all the guys were in their jungle fatigues and were handing them out, and something I'd done a hundred times before. And I called Randy and I said, Randy, I need, need a ride home. Can you come pick me up? I'll meet you at the, at the gate. And then all of a sudden, like six, ten squad cars showed up. And I said, I got to go. Something big's going down. I, this, this is an opportunity for a story. <laughs> so I go out, I, I leave the phone book, but I phone booth, but I left all my papers in the phone booth. I didn't, you know, I'm not that dumb. But, but, so I take like ten steps away from the phone booth, and somebody says, "There he is!" <laughs> and I'm surrounded by police, and they handcuff me. And, throw me in the back of the squad car, take me down to police headquarters, and they strip search me. I stand there naked as the day is long, and they're all reading Playboy magazines. <laughs> and it's a little embarrassing, <laughs> to say the least, but uh, this, this cop's, you know, they go through all my clothes, and the cop says, where are they? And I'm thinking, they're in the phone booth. <laughs> and he said, I said, where are what? He said, where are the drugs? <laughs> drugs? I don't have any drugs. You were selling drugs to those guys going back to, Viet going to Vietnam. Somebody saw you doing that. Oh, then I realized what horseshit it was. 
that, that just, somebody reported me passing out papers and came down and they hauled me off to jail. And, and they had to set me loose because once again they didn't have anything. Um, I'm sure my time's running out, so I better hit the big spots. Nine minutes. You got I, a minute. I got a minute. Okay. This, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jim. I gotta. I gotta tell it. So Mike here, I think it was your idea. I was reading the Declaration of Independence, and he says, "Have you guys ever read this thing? This is this is heavy stuff." It's a preamble. They're they're talking about the overthrow of the government by use of force. <laughs> and idea developed that, well, one of the, let me backtrack. We were suing the Army. Jim was, was uh, the driver behind that. We were suing the Army to, to get our paper on base. We wanted to distribute the paper on base. And <clears throat> so we thought that we could pass out the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. Who would, who would care about that, right? That's a patriotic thing to do. And uh, so we printed up a bunch of copies of the Declaration of Independence, went down to the PX on, on payday before the uh, 4th of July holiday, and we're passing them out left and right to everybody. And uh, it was about 20 minutes later that the uh, MP showed up and threw us all in squad cars and, and, uh, and took us down to the stockade. And Henry, Henry Lenny and I, we were in, in the same, um, same squad car together. And we're singing America the Beautiful <laughs> out the windows. <laughs> Off key, yeah, exactly. So we get to the jail and we've still got all these, these um, brochures of the Declaration of Independence and we're shoving them through the bars of the MPs and anybody else that were there. And we, we, were, having, uh, we were having a gay old time. Um, part of my job was when you, when you process out of the Army, when you process into the Army, you get two sets of dress greens. When you process out, you press a process out in your dress greens, but you have to turn another one in. Now, the military police have to wear dress greens every day. And so the MPs would come over to me where I had these bins of dress greens that guys had turned in when they were processing out, and they'd want to get, you know, they wanted to get free clothes. They could wear to work every day, and I'm like, have at it, man. They're not mine. <laughs> so I was friends with an awful lot of MPs. And I'm in jail, and one of them says, that's Irvin over there. So. They came up, Irwin, what are you doing here? So they, they treated me, they treated us all well. So uh, uh, anyway, what's, what's the court martial where it's you and the, the officer? Article 15. No, Article 15. Special court martial. Special court martial, that's it. Yeah, they, we, uh, there's Article 15, which is the lowest form <coughs> of punishment. punishment. Then there's the special court martial. And then there's the uh, general, the general court martial, which is the one that you saw Jack Nicholson in, and a few good men. And they wanted to give me an Article 15 and I, for what? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not accepting any kind of guilt for passing out the Declaration of Independence on the Fourth of July. I don't think so. <laughs> and they said, "Okay, well, you're going to have to go to a, a what's that?" What's the next one? Special court. Special one. Special one. I, they brought me in, and uh, we had a little trial, and I said, ah, now we're going to general. So they had me scheduled to sit up with this group of, of uh, five or six officers that were going to determine my fate for the heinous crime of distributing the, fourth, uh, the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. And, uh, then things built up, and they realized they were going to have to send me to jail, and what a PR disaster that would be for the Army. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they, they couldn't find any witnesses.
and saw us passing these things out through the bars at the jail with film from the PX. Nobody would, would say that they saw us do this thing, so the, uh, the charges were dropped. Now, fast forward um, a few years ago to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm on a tour with my son, my son Will over here, and we're going to college tours, and we end up in Philadelphia at Independence Hall, and we were the last people in there for the day. And I'm talking to the, the park ranger, telling him this story, you know, this is really special to me, that I made it to Independence Hall, and I, I nearly had my, my life cut short because of the, the Declaration of Independence, and here's where they signed it and, and made it up, and it, it really hit home. But anyway, I made it back to central Illinois and uh, made some great friends while I was in the service. Um, carried on with various charitable and philanthropic groups. Actually, I, I got elected to uh, to a government post. I ran for I ran for a supervisor post home and got elected to that. And I don't know. I guess I'll turn it over to these two. Thank you. Well, we'll just keep with an army theme here, and we'll just move right on to the guy at the end, Mike Royce. Well, as I was uh, thinking about this, uh, I think something that helped me frame what I have to say is that uh, Thinking about social movements, uh, activists don't make social movements. Activists are produced by social movements. What activists do, and we consider ourselves activists, uh, is help to cohere what people are feeling to make it more forceful, bring it back to people. And that's what, that's what we did in the, uh, in the military. So all of us have our own story, and it's, it, it's similar in many ways and unique in many ways. But uh, remember that about social movements creating activists. So just my, before I went into the military, I was an 18 year old kid, I graduated, I had just finished my first year of college. I came from a middle class family from a northern city. My family thought racism was wrong, so uh, I volunteered to go, go work in Mississippi. 1965, and again, I was a fairly protected uh, young boy. I was uh, the first week I was down there. I was uh, well, the first, second day I was down there, I was arrested with 100 other people for uh, we didn't even make it out of the black community. We made it about three blocks, saying you know, holding signs, you know, uh, fair employment, and things like that. They beat us put us in jail, and uh, I was also in jail with Stokely Carmichael, uh, who was also there. And I don't know if people know, know his name, that may be history, but anyway, so I'm an 18-year-old kid playing, after we were beaten, playing football with uh, a sock with Stokely Carmichael, but also listening to uh, these old guys. Stokely was 25, mm -hmm. I was 18. <laughs> listening to these old guys talk about black power and how they were going to organize the Black Panther Party. This is before the Black Panther Party. Black Panther Party in Lowndes County, Alabama. So that was one of the very seminal thing for me. Uh, after that, I was active in the anti-war movement for uh, at, at uh, NYU, New York University, for a couple of years. <clears throat> I was in the Students for Democratic Society, and I was in the Peace and Freedom Party. Uh, by the time I graduated, I was a Marxist, and so I had a two, had a, two routes to go. I had a uh, scholarship to go to graduate school, so I did the natural thing. I went to California, got a job doing labor organizing in a glass plant, worked there for a year. So I, obviously because I didn't go to graduate school, I didn't have a deferment. Uh, I was also with a bunch of revolutionaries that uh, thought uh, we had come to the conclusion that, that uh, 
fundamental change was necessary. It's not just a question of the war. It was not just a question of an aberrant sort of action. It was an outgrowth of uh, imperial, colonial aggression. Uh, so I was drafted uh, and uh, consciously decided to go in to organize. So uh, that was my mission. I didn't, I refused to be an officer. Well, they, I scored a guy on a test and they said, hey, do you want to be a warrant officer? Well, that's the guy who says, you know, drives a helicopter and murders people. So I said, no, no thanks, I don't want to do that. So I was a uh, grunt. So I was in basic training. Uh, my whole unit went to advanced infantry training, uh, and I really would kind of want to paint it, well, I'll paint it maybe a little later. So um, in advanced infantry training, we did a lot of fun things, like learn how to shoot 50 caliber machine guns and set up Claymore mines. And to give you an idea of what happens to young people, uh, I was old, I was 22, I was the second oldest guy in my company. Uh, a lot of the kids were 17. So we were in the Claymore mine, uh, you know, you'd get up at four, 4 or 5 in the morning and you'd run six miles in your combat boots and then you'd try and stay awake while they would talk to you about Claymore mines or something like that. And I remember very, very clearly the drill, drill sergeant saying, now boys, you know, if you see one of those little gooks coming at you, blow them away because they'll have, they'll have bombs on them you know, strapped around their waist. And I thought, Jesus Christ, what a hell of a thing to tell young people. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I was uh, active in basic training. I got busted for the first time uh, in the military. I called the shelter half a, uh, a coffee house, and I said, uh, hey, you know, I'm here in basic training. I wasn't smart enough to get off and get a drink. But anyway, I said, uh, I said, you know, can you bring Kids. me some, uh, you know, newspapers? I want to give it to my boys here. So uh, one of the shelter app people came screaming through the fort. And it was right after dinner, so I was kind of skulking around. Uh, and uh, they threw out a bunch of papers. And you know, I, I rushed to get it. And before I even got to the papers, I was surrounded by a drill sergeant and 20 GIs from an, another company. And they said, it's just the same thing to you. And they said, gotcha. And I, I said, you, uh, you might want to look in the bag. Uh, but of course, they thought I had a drug buzz. I mean, they thought I had drugs. Uh, so anyway, uh, they took my papers, unfortunately, so I couldn't give them up to my other uh, my boys. But anyway, I was, uh, then I had an Article 15 the next day. And uh, the, the captain was, I was in the Army from 1970 to 1972. The uh, captain, obviously, was a Vietnam attorney. His heart wasn't in it. He kind of looked at me and looked at the paper, and he said, hey, get out of here. Just don't do it again. So, of course, I did it again, but I didn't get caught in basic training. Uh, and, and advanced infantry training, I, I could see the handwriting on the wall. My uh, my unit was going to go to uh, what my unit did go to Vietnam. So I, right right before we got orders, I uh, the whole unit went. I, I thought, hmm, I'm not going to Vietnam. I'm not going to. I mean, cause, uh, that's I, I'll go to jail first. But then I thought, well, I'll apply, apply CO, conscientious objector, in the military. Now I wasn't really serious about it, but I did apply to the CO. And of course, by that time, military intelligence called me in and said. Don't worry about this application of yours. You aren't going anywhere. You're under a security flag. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so let me tell you some of the things we did. It, it, it uh, again, remember that the military at this point in 1970, black GI, you know, they sh they cut your hair off like your identity. Black GIs had afros to hear. You know, they came. Fort Lewis had 50,000 people. Part of us were being trained, but a lot of people were Vietnam vets coming back to be do their last six months before being kicked, yeah, kicked out of the uh, military. Uh, there's this thing called the DAF. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's an elaborate handshake. Uh, black GIs and white GIs in solidarity. Black GIs might be driving an officer, and they'd get out of the car and see another black GI. And, for like two or three minutes, you know, because it was kind of like a, 
fuck you, really, it's, you know, what it was. And uh, saluting, uh, I remember, uh, you know, we walking with another brother and we, we saw some officer comes and we kind of turn, turn around so you, you know, you didn't have to salute. Uh, and now this sounds ineffectual, but it really, what, I, what I'm saying is it was a reflection and concentration of what was happening in the military. GIs, uh, drugs were rampant, discipline broke down. So I'll tell you some of the things we did. Um, well, uh, we did a lot of things that are legal. I, I don't think people have explained to you the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's a crime punishable by six months in jail to distribute unauthorized literature. And the, the, that's why we got arrested for the Declaration of Independence, unauthorized literature. It was only when it got high enough up in the ranks that somebody said, oh, this is going to look horrible. Get these guys out of here. But anyway, uh, we, I think people have uh, talked enough about distributing the newspapers. We formed a uh, anti-war GI group of, uh, called the GI Alliance. And we had a, illegal mass meetings on base. Uh, I, I'll tell you about two of them. And again, this would have been a more serious crime if they had chosen to prosecute than uh, this distribution of uh, newspapers. One of them, uh, I remember, is uh, there are about 50 GIs uh, talking anti-war stuff in the, uh, one of the canteens. And there was an old guy, kind of not my age now, but he, he seemed really old to me, gray-haired guy sitting behind me. And he, and he, and, at, uh, you know, he's kind of listening really intently, and at a certain point, he leaned close to me and said, "Hey, you know, I've read Mao Zedong and Lin Piao too." And I thought, "What the?" But it was uh, it was General Bowling, the two-star general of the four, and he just kind of uh, there were too many of us there, and it was too incendiary to bust us, so he didn't do anything. More to the point, and also reflecting, I think the, the social movement is that. There was another uh, company where uh, barracks, where the uh, N N NCOs, the sergeants, were quite racist, and the the brothers had had just enough of this, and so we had a uh, the GI Lance. Well, I kind of followed the the lead of uh, the brothers, but we went to the uh, the barracks, and we confronted the sergeants, and made it known that this this was not acceptable, and. Uh, Sergeant, I mean, again, this this is an army where officers got fragged, where uh, and the, the, uh, the sergeants got the message that this was not going to apply. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that we did. Well, uh, I'll tell you one other thing. There was a part of the situation in the military at this time was uh, pacifying the troops, particularly the uh, Vietnam vets who were there and being discharged. So there's, they, the military had this brilliant idea, we're going to have a rock concert on base, <laughs> and you know the GIs will you know, come and group, and it'll be kind of cool. So there were you know, hundreds, you know, maybe a thousand GIs there at, you know, listening to this music, all kind of probably stoned a lot of us. But uh, anyway, uh, two of uh, the wives uh, who were active in the GI lines asked the, the band, I forget their name, uh, Thank you, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and that's one of the wives. Anyway, uh, you know, said to Earth, Wind, and Fire, hey, look, can we borrow the mic for something, you know, just for a little bit? And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, these two wives got up and gave a really good anti-war speech for, you know, about 10 minutes before they were arrested, and then both, both of them, one of whom is my wife, uh, were banned from seven western uh, states from going on the fort except for the PX, you could go to the PX. And uh, as another reflection of kind of different viewpoints, the next day I was hauled in front of a colonel. Now, if you're in E2, which I was, oh no, I made it to private first class. A colonel is like, you know, that's really up there. Anyway, the colonel looked at me and said, can't you control your wife? <laughs> I said, and, you know, kind of, that was the end of the conversation. So, we're, we're being amusing, but the, I think the <coughs> lessons uh, that we'd like to get to you all is that uh, you may pay a price 
Well, all of us did to a certain extent. I was one of the lucky ones. I actually got an honorable discharge. But my life was fashioned by what I did. Uh, Jim spent his whole life doing military law. Uh, several of us went to jails for uh, two, four, six months. But you, the fact that you pay a price is part, uh, or may pay a price, is part of what being an activist is about. You have to be willing to pay the price. But, you know, I, I have to say that was one of the best periods of my life. And I'll bet you, not one of us here, none of us who had a successful military career, not one of us would say anything except we were very proud of the fact that we resisted. It was an immoral war, it was racist uh, in nature and racist in the ranks, and uh, it's, it's right to rebel when things are wrong, and things were very, very wrong then. Okay, thank you. So we got one more guy, and uh, now we're going to turn from the Army to the Air Force. So uh, what, we, what we have here now to finish us off is uh, Dave Henry. Okay. Thank you. I tend to lose my voice uh, sometimes, so if I get hoarse, don't worry, I'm not, I don't have COVID. Um, so, uh, my name is Dave Henry. Uh, you've never heard of me. <laughs> I'm not famous. Uh, and I'm, I'm not up here because I'm important. Uh, I'm up here because I was part of something that was important. And it made me cry, Dave. <laughs> Um, I'll go back to uh, how I got here. Uh, I never heard about Vietnam until I was in high school. Um, and then when I did hear about it, I didn't want anything to do with it. I wasn't political. I was still going to be there. And when I went away to college, I said, I'll give them four years to get this over with before I get out. Uh, they didn't get it over with before I got out. Uh, I actually was the uh, editor of my campus newspaper my senior year, uh, and we turned that into an anti-war newspaper. Um, I gathered around me a staff of people that uh, shared my opinions. Uh, some of them could actually write, you know, which, uh, which is a bonus for newspaper work. And, uh, and I'm proud to say that uh, out of the school's hundred and something year history, we were the very first class that ever had a censorship board created uh, because of that. Uh, fact because of the paper. Uh, they didn't call it a censorship board, it was a publications board. All the articles were supposed to go by them before they went to press so they could check the grammar and everything and uh, and of course we just ignored that <coughs> and went ahead and put it out. Um, but I'm going to skip past that. I, I got drafted in, in 1970. I, uh, I freaked out uh, and went and joined the Air Force. Um, I went, uh, I was sent down to San Antonio, Texas to Lackland Air Force Base for basic training. Uh, there were uh, two of us there, myself and another guy who were offered uh, uh, officer candidate school in flight training. And I got together with that guy and I said, you know what this means, don't you? Uh, they want us to, to go bomb people and kill people. And, and we made a pact uh, that we wouldn't go. Unfortunately, when the time came, he changed his mind and, and went. Uh, but I didn't. And uh, 
I got a nice letter from the Air Force uh, saying that the candidate uh, me, uh, had refused his class assignment. It's interesting wording. Uh, it turns out that that wouldn't be the last letter I would ever get from the Air Force. But, uh, it was a good start. I, uh, after finishing uh, up in basic training, I was assigned to, to uh, McCord Air Force Base. I'd never been west of Mississippi. I knew nothing about it. Uh, they, they gave me a ticket on a commercial flight out to SeaTac. And uh, I thought, that's funny. I'm in the Air Force. I'm flying commercial. I, I thought I should have been hitching a ride with the Blue Angels or something. Uh, didn't happen. Didn't happen. I, I got to uh, I got the SeaTac, and I wanted to tell this story just because it's a little funny. Uh, as far as I know, I, I was the only airman on that flight. Uh, when I got there, uh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. Uh, didn't really have instructions exactly, and uh, and I'm I'm just kind of angry, scared. Uh, you know, lonely, depressed. What am I doing here? What am I into? And and, uh, and of course, it, it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> and just out of the blue, here comes some happy-go-lucky guy bouncing down through the airport, singing, "The bluest skies you'll ever see are in Seattle." <laughs> that's a true story. I, I couldn't possibly make that up. And. Uh, and right away, I, I thought, geez, the Northwest uh, has the most optimistic people ever. <laughs> so I finally located some uh, Air Force personnel. They stuck me on a shuttle, uh, sent me over to McCord. I got set up, got my bunk and the barracks and everything. And uh, I'm in there with all these big, giant, drab walls around me, and it's depressing as hell. Uh, the walls, as it turns out, would serve a purpose later on, however. Uh, I'll get to that. But, uh, but I'm in there thinking, boy, what was me? I don't want nothing to do with this business. And, and, uh, but I had not been a stranger to the anti-war movement. Uh, and I, I knew that it was uh, ubiquitous. I, I knew it was everywhere. And I, I knew that it had to be out here, somewhere. I kept my eyes open, uh, and one day I saw them. There they were out there uh, with the newspaper, the Free Press, uh, the GI Alliance. You know, uh, either they were the GI Alliance or they would become. I can't remember exactly now at what point that name uh, happened, but they already had the paper going. And I said, "Man, I am." Glad to see you guys. I've been looking for you guys. Uh, I'm in the Air Force. I don't want anything to do with this war. I don't want anything to do with the military. I want out, and you got to help me get out. And uh, and somebody uh, might have been Randy. I can't remember. Uh, I said, "Well, yeah, we can do that." Uh, <laughs> We know people, we know lawyers, uh, we can hook you up with the Pacific Counseling Service. You can, uh, you know, get your, uh, what do you call it? Your, uh, CO? Yeah. Conscious. Conscious objector, yeah. You can write that up and, and whatever. And it says, but uh, instead, uh, <laughs> what about this? What if you decided to stay in and help, you know, organize the anti-war movement? in the military. What if you did that? And I thought, what? <laughs> uh, and I thought about it a little bit, and, and I said, well, yeah, I, I could do that. Um, and I did that, and, and uh, I'm so glad I did. Uh, there were many things that, that we did. I, I jumped right in with both feet, uh, distributing the paper, uh, talking to airmen on base about the war, uh, we did a lot of things that the brass didn't like, and uh, 
and for that was really my first eye opener uh, when I realized that it wasn't just about me, that it was about everybody. Uh, so I'm I'm listing that. Randy said uh, we should say what our lessons were uh, in this little talk. That was my first lesson. And it's a very important one. Um, we had a movie, and we had a movie projector. Uh, and I used to take that projector onto the base and show that movie, only the beginning. It was a story about the heroism of the Vietnamese, about the interwar movement, about what was going on with people uh, fighting against the war. And we used those big grab tray walls as a, a movie screen. And uh, we did it many times. And, uh, and we had to protect uh, those GIA assets. You know, we didn't want the brass or the MPs to get a hold of those. And I was a little lax about security back in those days. I wasn't really too keen on how much danger we were putting ourselves in. But the funny thing is, uh, a lot of the uh, airmen and GIs were uh, aware of that. And, uh, and sometimes uh, they would uh, just spontaneously form lookouts and tip us off. Like if, uh, if the uh, brass was coming or whatever and, and help us to skedaddle out of there, you know, and, and, uh, and that happened. On, uh, more than one occasion, um, and one time I, I was going to mention a friend of mine who spoke at uh, UPS yesterday, who's not here today, he and I were out at Fort Lewis distributing literature in the barracks, and uh, uh, going from one building to the next, uh, talking to GIs, and then uh, a couple of GIs came up and said, hey, you guys, they're, they're on their way. The MPs are coming. Get out of here. You can exit out that way. And so we took off, uh, and sure enough, they were right on our tail. We headed out in the woods. We could see them with their flashlights looking for us. We laid down in the woods all night, all night until the next morning. That was with Glenn Robb. Uh, next morning, uh, a lot of people were out walking around, and we got up and blended in with them and walked off the base. That was a very close call. But once, uh, once again, the, uh, the, the GIs protected us. Um, we had a lot of struggle in the GI Alliance about the war. I had a very naive view of the war. I thought it was an aberration. Um, I grew up thinking, you know, America the beautiful and whatever, and, and how did this happen? We've always been on the side of right and justice, and now here we are doing these horrible things uh, over there. It's just immoral or, you know, and, and people struggled uh, with me about that. I said, look, that's, that's not an exception. That's the rule. That's what's been going on. They just don't tell you that. You don't find out about it until you're in, in there, once you're in there. And, you know, some people don't mind it. Uh, they say about 10% of the population is a psychopath, so. Uh, <laughs> Those people make great soldiers. <laughs> but normal people don't like to do stuff like that. They don't like to torture people, kill people, rape. You know, if you're normal, you just can't do that kind of stuff. And, and that's why there was such a big uh, uprising against that war. When the GIs came back telling their stories, uh, it was shocking. It's still shocking to me. Mm -hmm. 
That was the second thing I learned. That this war was the rule, not the exception. When the ground troops were refusing to go out in the field in Vietnam, uh, and the Pentagon was trying to figure out what to do, they came up with the idea, as everyone knows now, that to expand the air war. <clears throat> now, when that happened, that put a lot of focus on the Air Force, and, uh, and I was busy trying to glean information at McCord about what exactly was happening. And uh, a big demonstration had been planned for just outside the main gate of McCord. Uh, specifically to, uh, you know, oppose the air war. Uh, the brass were kind of freaking out about it. They didn't want people to know about it or go to it, and they kept everybody working. Nobody had time off. Uh, they tried to lock down the base, uh, including me. I was out there working. Uh, but then uh, they had to give us lunch at some point. And when they did, I hightailed it out to the main gate. Uh, I was still in uniform. And I, uh, at that time, I never really gave a lot of thought to about doing stuff while we're in uniform. Uh, I didn't realize it was like a really not a good idea. But uh, I went out there and actually gave a speech uh, at this demonstration. And, uh, and somehow uh, a photograph of me given that speech, ended up in my hometown newspaper in Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> my parents saw it. <laughs> and uh, a few days later, I got a letter from my mom. <laughs> we didn't, didn't have cell phones. And she says, what are you doing out there? Are you just causing trouble? Uh, why can't you just find a nice girl and settle down? <laughs> I thought, Mom, come on, Mom. yeah. But I took Mom's advice. I found a nice girl. Uh, and, you know, we, we marched side by side in many demonstrations. <laughs> and after all these years, we're still together. It's my wife, Mary Ann. Daughter and Monica right there. Aww. So a lot of this uh, history, I'm sure that uh, my daughter probably doesn't know a lot of these details. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, we can do this. So make a long story short. Uh, I was called into uh, Colonel Jones' office, Colonel Jones, squadron commander. Uh, he and I had a very interesting relationship. Uh, he said, I'm getting rid of you, and uh, I'm giving you a general discharge. Sign right here, and you're out of here. And uh, I didn't know much about the different kind of discharges. There are five different kinds. and. Uh, and they can affect you later in life from trying to get a job and whatever, you know, if you get a bad discharge. I didn't know much about it, but at the same time, I thought, you know, I'm not going to take a general discharge. I mean, why? I, I got, you don't have nothing on me. I got a good record, you know, I'm great training scores, my tests. And everything. I said, if anything, I should be your boss. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> I was thinking it, though. So, uh, so he didn't like that much. And uh, the next day, he called me back in again. And this time, he had an honorable discharge offer. And, uh, you know, I took it. <laughs> it the interesting thing is that uh, in, in my personal growth, uh, I had come to the GI Alliance 
looking for help to get out of the military. At the end of my career, which was a year and a half, the military was looking for me to get out. <laughs> and, and I wanted to stay in. So it kind of came full circle. <laughs> but I went ahead and got the discharge, and I got a nice letter from the Air Force, another one uh, telling me that I could never again set foot on the Corps Air Force Base in my life. <laughs> And then he handed me another letter from the base commander of Fort Lewis with pretty much the same wording. Uh, so I got three nice letters uh, from the military, which I'm very proud of. And, uh, and the third lesson that I learned from all this, from being uh, a part of the anti-war movement, and seeing what kind of effect it had. The lesson I learned is that we can win. 